Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to the Finance and Neighborhoods Committee today. I'm Sally Bagshaw, Chair of this committee, and with me is Council President Bruce Harrell. Thank you so much for coming. We have a very long agenda today, unusual for the Finance Committee, and if there is no objection, the agenda will be adopted. No objection. No objection. The agenda is adopted. So the five items we have on today's agenda include first a briefing and discussion and possible vote for an ordinance landmarking aspects of what was the old spaghetti factory on Elliott Avenue. We will hear from our friends in the Department of Neighborhoods. Next, we're going to have a community panel on the sweetened beverage tax and how that tax can be used to increase access to food in communities most impacted by the tax. We're going to follow that up with a discussion that will be led by our central staff person, Yolanda Ho, on potential considerations for the ordinance, whether to create a dedicated fund. Uh, some of the options are yes, no, and after the 2020 budget. So we'll hear more about that. We're also, after that, going to have a second panel in conversation on the importance of the Equitable Development Initiative, EDI. Um, we know that this is important to all of us. We're also dealing with a balanced budget and how we're going to approach this in 2020 and 21 thereafter. We're also then going to have an opportunity here from our Parks Department friends. We are going to lift a proviso for one of my favorite projects, that's City Hall Park and Yesler Crescent. We put money in the budget last year, but provisoed it until we could see a budget on how the money would be spent. We've been meeting with Parks and, um, and our friends across the street in King County since the beginning of this year. So today I'm hopeful that we'll lift the proviso and approve Parks proceeding to spend the money according to the plan. Um, and finally, we are going to have a, another briefing discussion and possible vote on the appointment of Bobby Humes as the director of Seattle Human Services Department, no, it's Human Resources Department. So um, I want to thank Bobby Humes for all of his work. We had asked him a number of questions at our last meeting, and he supplemented his resume. He had um, answered the additional questions. So I am very excited and hopeful that we can move forward with um, his vote today, this afternoon. So we have public comment time now um, on items that appear on today's agenda. We've got eight people. I'm going to ask you, to, I'm going to call your names, and I'm going to ask you to step up to the microphones and be ready and prepared uh, to comment so that we can move forward. We'll have two minutes each. Um, Kathleen Husfeld, um, it looks like Julia Prosciutto, um, Marin Kas Kasuhan, I'm sorry if I slaughtered your names. So Kathleen, please, and um, if it's Julia, would you kindly get over, go over to the other second microphone now so we're just ready to go. And Marin, um, if you'll just move up to the front row. Thank you so much. Thank you. And if you'll I, state your name, please. I am Kathleen Hosfeld, and I am the Executive Director of Homestead Community Land Trust. And I'm here to strongly endorse Councilmember O'Brien's proposal to create a dedicated fund for EDI. The Equitable Development Initiative is an embodiment of the intent that brought Homestead into being and compels us in our work today. Homestead was founded more than 25 years ago by citizen activists to address the rapid displacement occurring even then in the Central District. And our current priority is one anti-displacement strategy, which is community-owned, permanently affordable home ownership, because we believe that the everyday heroes who contrib contribute to our quality of life should be able to remain in the communities that they make great. One of our purposes is to share our skills and experience with organizations like those bettered by the EDI fund in low and moderate income uh, neighborhoods and communities to enable encourage and support improvement of housing and land in ways that lift up those communities. So although EDI funds do not support Homestead's work, we support EDI's focus on community-initiated project grants. With a great deal of respect for those who make difficult budget choices between competing priorities, I maintain that investments in new projects and anti-displacement must not only be protected, but be strengthened. The need for new projects is urgent. We must accelerate the growth of community-initiated projects focused on anti-displacement and equitable access 
so that all might benefit from our city's tremendous growth and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you for coming down today. Julia, Marin, and then Lindsay. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Julia Pasciuto, and I'm a policy analyst at Puget Sound SAGE. I'm also a member of the Race and Social Equity Task Force who helped, helped create the Equitable Development Initiative and sit on the EDI Advisory Board. Over the last few years, we have seen displacement pressures grow significantly in our cities. Families, workers, cultural and religious institutions and businesses are getting pushed out of our city at rapid pace. The EDI is the only fund that addresses a comprehensive anti-displacement strategy using a racial justice framework, and we need to grow and protect this important fund. The last two years of the fund, we have received over $30 million of eligible asks uh, for community-driven de development that roots people and institutions in place. And, and this year, um, we're seeing less money than was allocated in the short-term rental tax regulation. We need to secure the $5 million from the short-term rental tax for EDI grants for 2020 and beyond before this year's budget cycle. Um, we urge you to support this program by putting Councilmember O'Brien's legislation to a vote later this month. And we also support the same demand for the sweet and beverage tax as well. Thank you for coming, Julia. Marin, and I'm, if I'm saying your name wrong, would you please, for the record, uh, say it correctly, and then Lindsay. Hello, my name is Maron Kasahun. I am the uh, Community Development Manager at HomeSite, also a member of the Race and Social Equity Task Force. Displacement is occurring at a ra rapid pace and disproportionately impacts people of color and low-income folks. Holistic community stabilization through community-driven development is the only effective strategy to prevent displacement and the Equitable Development Initiative is the only tool the city has to address the multiple equity drivers that prevent displacement. As a grantee of the EDI fund leading the development of the Othello Square project, Homesite will be able to leverage the $1.5 million investment from EDI tenfold for their project. We urge you to schedule a vote for Councilmember O'Brien's legislation to create a dedicated fund for both the EDI and Sweden Beverage beverage tax by the end of this month. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have Lindsay, then Violet, then Simone. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Lindsay Hoban. Lindsay, hold on yes, just a please. second. Can I ask Violet to come on up? Thank you for that. And Simone next, please. Thank you. I'm Lindsay Hoven with the American Heart Association and the Seattle Healthy Kids Coalition. As I shared at this committee's last meeting, we were proud to support the passage of the initial ordinance that established the sweetened beverage tax, and we're proud to support Councilmember uh, O'Brien's proposed ordinance to create a dedicated fund for SBT revenue. This could increase transparency and ensure revenue is invested in a way consistent with Council's original commitment to community to grow and expand food access, and early learning programs. The tax is off to a promising start. It was designed to improve health by raising the price of sugary drinks to deter consumption and to raise revenue to be reinvested into community health and well-being. We've seen declines in sales from similar taxes in Philadelphia, Berkeley, and Mexico, and the University of Washington evaluation of the Seattle tax is underway and due this fall. Importantly, Diverse communities in Seattle are already benefiting from meaningful investments in food access and early learning. Though actual revenue happens to be higher than projections, which were based on assumptions since there was no historical basis, let's not divert funding from the spirit of the original ordinance and the commitment made to community. Please ensure all sweetened beverage tax revenue is used to expand food access and early learning programs in communities that need it most with passage of this proposed ordinance. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Violet, Simone, Patience. Maybe I should get on this one. Good. This one would be better. All right. Um, good afternoon, council members. My name is Violet Labatai. I am with a lot of organizations, but I'm the director of the Tenant Union of Washington. I'm also on the board of Got Green. I'm here to speak on the EDI um, and the sugary beverage tax. We know right now that the displacement um, of tenants, of citizens in the city of Seattle is at a rapid pace. 
and we want to protect these um, fundings that were allocated to help people in displacement. Um, I'm here to speak about also the sugary tax beverage and what we're trying to do is we come to you, um, Sally, Council Member uh, Backshaw, to urge you to schedule a vote for Council Member O'Brien's um, legislation to create a dedicated fund for both the EDI and the sugary tax. Um, I actually just got my vouchers for uh, the sugary fresh bucks, and I'm, I'm happy about this because it helps me to um, buy fresh fruits and um, buy carrots and stuff like that because I'm qualified to get um, fresh bucks. And so this, these, these important, important, um, you know, uh, funding does go to communities of color, that people that look like us and low income. And we ask that you, we urge you, Sally Bagshaw, Council Member Bagshaw, to um, schedule a vote for Council Member O'Brien's legislation again to create dedicated fund for both the EDI and the sweetened beverage tax by mid-July. Thank you, council members. Thank you for coming, Violet. Uh, Simone, patience, and um, is it Quam? Uh, okay. Um, hi, my name is Simone Adler, and um, I'm the organizing director at Community Alliance for Global Justice, and we are a member of the Coalition to Close the Food Security Gap with Got Green and other organizations. Um, and I am speaking to strongly support um, the ordinance to create a fund for the sugary beverage tax to ensure that the revenue for this tax is being used as intended, um, especially in to be accountable to communities of color and low-income communities that are impacted by the tax um, and in, in line with what the tax was um, intended to do in the first place um, to expand community-driven food access programs. Um, as community organizers and people that are working on the ground and educating about the benefits of this tax, there's been a lot of work that's happened door knocking and otherwise um, to get people to understand and support the tax. And so making sure that the revenue follows through on those commitments is um, important both as community-based organizations, but also for the city to be accountable and transparent with how it's using the funds. Um, and so we really push for the ordinance to be created to make sure that that happens. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Patience. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Patience Malaba, and I am the policy manager at the Housing Development Consortium. I am here to speak in support of Council Member O'Brien's legislation to ensure that there's a dedicated fund for the EDI. And I will echo a lot of the voices that have already spoken of how key this tool is in really getting us to a place where we are achieving our equity goals as a city. Uh, the gap between the 30 million in application and the 5 million in actual uh, dedicated funds is one that's telling of the deep need for a dedicated uh, fund source. And I think it's important that we move forward in ensuring that the portion that was allocated in the short term uh, rental ordinance is actually being placed in that dedicated fund uh, for the EDI. And in the future, we look forward to talking about other sources of actual extending the fund because the need continues to be very visible with many communities of color, low-income communities really being affected by displacement in the most disproportionate manner. And I thank this committee for your work in uh, getting us to a place of where there is an actual legislation that will be passed. So we look forward to seeing the legislation move forward and be passed. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Patience. Please, and our last speaker. Just state your name, please. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Quinn Pham. I'm with the Friends of Little Saigon. I'm also here to urge you to support the dedicated fund for the Equitable Development Initiative and the Sweetened Beverage Tax. Um, I'm here to really speak on Little Saigon and our, our pressures and um, challenges that we're facing right now. Earlier this month, we already we lost another small business, Seattle Deli, to a private developer. Um, they had to close their doors after almost 30 years of being there. 
and their family not only owned the deli, that, but they also owned the property that they were on, and they opened doors to other small businesses. And now we've lost out on that property. And without this fund, we wouldn't be able to continue to advocate for uh, resources so that the community can remain in place and own and control our own properties. We don't want to see future um, businesses and properties that are owned and controlled by the community lost again because of all the development pressures happening in our neighborhoods. Um, the EDI also supports the Friends of Little Saigon in our ventures to uh, acquire property and develop something that we can also provide to the community to anchor the neighborhood. And so without this dedicated source, we wouldn't be able to do that. So I, I do urge you to continue to support that, the, to push for the five million to be dedicated to EDI. Thank you. Very much. So that ends our public comment period, and I would like to move on to the first item of business, which is our landmark project. So, if you'd like to come up, Sarah, and would you like to read this in, Allison? Thank you. Item number one, Council Bill one one nine five four zero, an ordinance relating to historic preservation and point posing controls upon the Ainsworth and Dunn Warehouse, a landmark designated by the Landmarks Preservation Board under Chapter twenty five dot twelve of the Seattle Municipal Code. Thank you very much. So would you just like, we'll start um, introductions up here and um, your name and where you're working. Sure, I'm Joel Eslinian with Meriwether Partners, the company that uh, redeveloped the Ainsworth and Dunn building. Great, thank you. Jesse Claussen, McCullough Hill Dairy. Sarah Sote, Department of Neighborhoods. Thank you all. So Sarah, are you kicking this off? Yes, I am. And I do want to say thank you all for coming. And if you feel rushed today, um, I apologize for that. It's We've got a lengthy that's, agenda, so we may be moving on that's really okay. quickly. So I'm here for the Ainsworth and Dunn Warehouse Building at 2815 Elliott Avenue North. It was designated on August 20th, 2014 under standards C, D, and F. I won't go over what those are today. <laughs> Um, the controlled features are the exterior of the building and some of the exposed interior heavy timber structural system on the first floor and a portion of the site adjacent to the west side of the building. The building was built in 1902 and the architect was Stephen Alston Jennings. It was constructed in 1902 by the salmon packing firm Ainsworth and Dunn for use as a warehouse. Um, the thing that I find really interesting about this building is that it was built to operate in tandem with a pier that was built across the um, across West Alaska Alaska Way. Alaska Way. And there's still some other buildings along the waterfront that are owned by the original owner that also own the pier. So it's just kind of an interesting pattern that's occurred. That's so, all I'll say. Well, I, what I want to say, the most important thing, is that this is the old spaghetti factory. So it is. if anybody <laughs> really wants to know where it is and what we're talking about. Yes, that please. is true. Jesse, did you want to, did you have comments that you wanted to no, bring in? No, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for the owner and the owner can also speak for himself, but we're excited to be here. We're um, supportive of the designation. And interestingly, we're, um, close to after this ordinance is passed, we will be before the landmarks board to get um, transfer of development rights certified by the board to sell off the remaining development rights from the landmark building. So it's one of the only incentives that is available to landmark buildings to um, kind of, uh, I guess, make some dollars off of the, the property that's been landmarked. Um, and we're really excited to do that. Right. Joel, and do you have how many stories? for TDR purposes, do, do you get credit for? We're getting 70,000 square feet, so you can tell me how many stories <laughs> that. Well, it, it's as if, um, I guess the opportunity that we don't have by preserving the building is building a new six-story building. Okay, that's what I was looking yeah. for with six stories. Thank you. Um, the construction's coming along. I saw the new windows going in recently. It looks really quite beautiful. Yeah, those are, thank you. Those are the new old windows. Oh. Those were all rehabbed and put back in place. Well, they look really good. Thank, thank you. you. So anything you would like to add about this? Uh, no, only that the TDR program that Jesse referred to is really an important incentive to help um, fund what is an increasingly expensive endeavor to preserve these historic buildings. Well, and this one in particular, I think, it adds so much just to the character of the community on the north end of Alaskan Way. So I want to thank you, all, all of you who are involved in this. Any other questions from my colleagues? 
Okay, if not, um, I would like for the committee to consider uh, passing Council Bill 119540. Second. Okay, uh, any other comments? Okay, well, it's been moved and seconded. If there's no further discussion, all in favor say aye. 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 None opposed, no abstention, so thank you very much. Thank you. It passes, and I appreciate um, your coming today as quick as it's been. Have a good day. Thank you. Thanks. Very good. Okay, um, Allison, if you would kindly read in our second item, which is one of the reasons I think my council colleagues have to say thank you, Councilmember O'Brien, Councilmember Gonzalez, Councilmember Pacheco, for joining us. So the next item, please. Item number two, Council Bill 119551, an ordinance related to creating a fund for sweet and beverage tax revenues. And who all is coming to the table? We've got Kelly Brown, thank you. Yolanda, thank you for being here. Excellent. Um, Yolanda, I'm just going to ask you to start off with introductions, and as we go down the line, if you will state your name and with whom you're working. Yolanda Ho, Council Central Staff. Tanika Thompson, Got Green. Kelly Brown, Executive Director of North Helpline. Okay. And my name is Lika Suzumura, and I'm a Community Advisory Board member. Good. Thank you very much. Yo Yolanda, do you want to start off with, or someone else doing I this? I think we are going to start with the community panel, just to talk about how this tax will impact them directly. Okay, very good. So who would like to start? I Looks like everybody's looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can start. Um, I do have some just general, um, like reviewing the budget recommendations that we made as well as the fund itself. Do you have a preference of where I start? No, I think that we'll, we've got about 20 minutes or so Okay. for this item, so we'd just love to hear from you about what your involvement's been and what's important to you going forward. Okay, then I think I'll start with our budget recommendations for 2020 because we just submitted those earlier this week um, to give context and then I'll speak about the separate fund. Um, so this year, we or just recently, we made our 2020 budget recommendations for the council and the mayor and this was after a process of gathering community input. We had two uh, meetings for the community where over 60 community members attended and that was at the beginning of May and from those uh, the information that we gathered we then developed our recommendations um, inclusive of those the community voice so some of the highlights that I want to point out is that for 2020 we focused solely on the unallocated funds as well as the one-time funds and this was very intentional in order to maintain any of the current programming that was happening we did not want to take any funds out of current programming because we recognize how important that is for our programs to really establish and be effective. Um, and so among the, the funds that were unallocated, uh, we wanted to really make the focus of the investments go into community-led activities. So similar to what we saw with the innovation fund with the um, food access that went out through an RFP process, we want to expand that to the early childhood education component of the, of the tax as well as expanding that for the food access. And in addition to that, we allotted more funds for FreshBooks because we know that that has been a hugely successful program and there is more um, community members that can be reached if that is expanded. We also uh, were proposed from the budget office that there was interest in having money go towards food bank uh, renovations, from what I understand. And so we also unanimously voted on approving that as well. And that seems like a good win for everyone. There's also funds that we expanded for evaluation because one thing that we consistently heard from the community is that people really want to know if this is working. They want to know, are people getting more access to food? Who is being reached through the tax funds? And who is providing those services? And so we recognize that evaluation is a huge endeavor to be able to do and that really requires uh, establishing what is being determined as success for the for the programs and then making the uh, system to be able to gather that information so we put additional funds into evaluation on top of what was already allocated for 2019. Um, there's also the funds that were for the counter marketing that had gone in for, for this year and recognizing that in order to do that well and effectively, we wanted to put more funds into that. 
And then lastly, with the one-time investments, uh, there are funds that are going to be going towards an assessment for the Seattle Public Schools Nutrition Services. Um, as you may know, there is a new nutrition director who is very interested and skilled, um, has experience in transferring a system into scratch cooking. Um, so before we jumped into putting money into infrastructure, we really wanted to do an assessment to fully see what was needed to do that effectively with a long-term vision for that to be successful. We also heard from community members that in order to do some of the programs that are existing, for example, the Fresh Bucks program, distributing food to preschools and community centers, um, as well as the after school and community meal programs, they need more uh, things like refrigeration, uh, large equipment to be able to process foods, and so we put money into that as well. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, our recommendations. And just moving into the a separate allocated fund that has been proposed by Council Member O'Brien. Um, all of the council members are, are the um, community advisory board members are also very much in support of that. Um, for, for the main reason being transparency with the use of funds and holding accountability to the original intent of the ordinance of expanding and growing the existing programs and not having it be displaced to other, other programs. Um, and so in order to protect that and really have accountability, and transparency to the community, we all are in support of having that separate fund for the sugary beverage tax revenue. Thank, thank, thank you for coming today. I really appreciate you, you taking me. your time. Um, Kelly Brown, please. Wow. Hi, um, again, I'm Kelly Brown from North Helpline. We operate two food banks in Lake City and Bitter Lake, and I'm here to kind of talk about what an expansion of funds would look, or how that would look at North Helpline, uh, as opposed to the supplanting of funds, which happened this past year. Um, the Through the SBT funds, uh, there was a wonderful study which was presented to council um, examining the needs of food banks and food access throughout the city. Um, and their findings was that we report funding difficulties uh, at food banks to be able to meet the needs that we're seeing in our pantries and food banks. Um, we, the needs for funding are for staffing, for vehicles, for food, for uh, space, and then just general funding. We need to have the staff to be able to deliver our services. Personally, at North Helpline, we have community groups approach us quite frequently looking to add a pop-up site at a school or at uh, a housing development or different things like that, and we just simply don't have the staffing to meet that need right now um, within our current staffing structure. So that is something that could be possible with the expansion of funds is expanding that staffing to be able to do that, as well as purchasing culturally appropriate and healthy fresh food. Uh, that's the best way to deliver food to folks is being able to uh, purchase things. We have wonderful partners who uh, give lots of donations of foods and things like that, but really having that purchasing power to supplement and to be able to provide the full complement of nutrition to the communities that we're serving is super important. Um, and so, yes, expansion of funds would provide those opportunities. Uh, and we definitely support the legislation in front of us. Um, can I just go back to something, Lika, you raised, and it went by me fairly quickly, that the board recommended additional funds for food banks this year? Because I know there was some, some discussion last year. I just want to make sure I understood what you said. Correct. My understanding that it's specifically for infrastructure. Infrastructure being what Kelly's talking about, or for for more food itself, I'm I'm confused. I think it was for capital, uh, for rebuilding or, or doing improvements to the space or, or different things like that, which are needed across the city as well. Okay. Um, so different capital projects. All right. Yeah. Thank you. May, yes, yes, please. Yeah, on the on the infrastructure investment recommendation is the. Is the intent to pursue um, more of the food pantry grocery store model um, that I know that many food banks and food pantries are heading in that direction? Yeah, that's that's a piece of it. Mm -hmm. My understanding from what they presented to us that there was a need for the Ballard Food Bank and then Northwest Harvest also needs mm -hmm. um, some infrastructure support and then that would be about half of the funds that they allocated and then the other half would be going out to through an RFP process so that other food banks could apply mm -hmm. for those funds. Great. Uh, I, I've heard, and I'm definitely not the expert on this, but maybe you can help, that um, some of the way that food is flowing through the system to folks at food banks, there's a need for refrigeration, more refrigeration on site because of the, um, uh, I believe if I hear correctly, there's protein showing up 
um, in a way that is great, and yet um, when it comes in big waves, you, you can't just sit down on a shelf, it needs to be refrigerated. And so that was one of the needs that I had heard identified that, that food banks need. But, uh, yeah, definitely cold storage is gold um, in the food bank. <laughs> just being able to have our fridge to put produce in to stay fresh. Uh, we have wonderful donations coming in from community gardens and pea patches um, and being able to just to store them safely and get them out to the few folks who need them as well as if the meat donation comes in, being able to put that in the freezer and um, so that the supply is something that can be relied upon by the people that we're serving rather than have a bunch at one time or like, oh, this one day we got a bunch, so everybody gets it. Um, and being able to accept more of those donations so that we're able to per, uh, serve our communities. Good, thank to, you. To add and clarify, Please. that is part of the one-time investments that we put in specific for things like refrigeration. Yes. Mm. Thank you, it's very helpful. Tanika, and welcome. Thank you. Um, so my name is Tanika Thompson. I am the food access organizer at Got Green. Um, going to a food bank is a little different from the work that I do. Um, we aim to reach families who are in the food security gap. And those families are families that are working and they make is what considered a living wage. Yet they are not, um, they are, because of the, the cost of rent, in Seattle these days, they're unable to provide healthy food for their families. Um, they will not go to food banks. And so the Fresh Bucks and Fresh Bucks expansion programs are very important for these families. They won't go to food banks because they think that food banks are for people who are not working or are low income, and they don't see themselves in that category. And they say, well, let's save that food for someone else who needs it more than I do. Um, so right now, we have been able to reach, I think, let's see, 2,000 families, enroll 2,000 people into the Fresh Bucks voucher program. But I just realized that we can do so much more. The waiting list is so long. If we had the revenue, uh, the, all of the revenue from the tax from last year, we could have reached so many more families. Do you, know, do you have numbers? On that, Tanika? Um, I only have numbers for God Green. I know that there's a total of 2,000 families enrolled. Uh, between eight organizations, we all had the opportunity to, opportunity to enroll 150 individuals apiece. And then there was a public site that enrolled 1,000 people. Thank you. You're welcome. And so God Green was able to reach um, uh, demographics of people who were 60 or older, um, 53 people who are 6 year or older and seniors are having a hard time having access to healthy fruits and vegetables. Um, we were also able to reach a lot of African American individuals. And like I said, a lot of the people, most, the majority of the people who were enrolled were families in the food security gap. Um, they don't have um, access to benefits like EBT and SNAP. And so we really didn't want to reach out to those in, uh, too many of those individuals because they do have access to the Fresh Breaks program. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say all this to say that I think that it's really significant that we have more money to be able to go towards the Fresh Bucks expansion program because there is such a great need. The waiting list shows that need. Thank you, Tanika. You're welcome. Um, any comments or anybody <laughs> want to respond? Okay, well, Yolanda, that brings it up to you. Yeah. And um, you've written an excellent memo. Thank you for that. And I've also distributed to all of you a letter that um, our budget director, Ben Noble, sent down about 45 minutes before this meeting started. So I want to make sure that all of you had a copy of that. Okay, so um, as we, we provided some background a couple weeks ago about the sweet, history of the sweetened beverage tax, and so I run through a quick summary in my memo about um, the things that um, the revenues can be spent on, and um, based on some of the conversation here, we might want to think about um, amending that to allow for capital project investments for food banks, because right now that's not um, in the list. Um, right now it's only Seattle Preschool Program capital projects. But that's something to think about. And um, just kind of reviewing what had happened during budget last year, um, which um, impacted our 2019 adopted budget um, in regards to the uh, use of SB the um, unanticipated excess uh, SBT revenues to supplant a general fund and um, in 
specific programs. I um, also lay out just kind of identify the programs in which that occurred, um, primarily in the uh, Department of Education Early Learning and Human Services Department, um, specifically uh, things like food banks, um, the parent child home program, uh, child care vouchers, and a nurse family partnership. So, uh, and then also note where last year during budget, we, um, there was a green sheet uh, sponsored by um, council members Juarez and uh, O'Brien to provide some additional funding for food banks last year and one time, um, the 270,000 in excess ongoing funds. And so that leads us to um, the legislation sponsored by Council Member O'Brien, Council Bill 119551, which we uh, briefly discussed um, at the last committee meeting, but um, made a couple of my changes um, that I want to talk about. Um, so again, we, we are creating a dedicated fund to track revenues and expenditures by uh, city departments and also establishing financial policies um, with regards to the SBT revenue. Specifically, where uh, one thing is to codify the policies, so have them in the municipal code so people can see them easily instead of having to try to track down the ordinance. Um, so we would be adding a new section to the municipal code in chapter five and um, increase the flexibility for the allocation of funds to one time or limited term expenditures. So instead of um, dedicating 10% specifically of the SBT proceeds to these uses, um, we could allow up to 10%, um, just kind of providing a little more flexibility. Last year, we amended the initial, the original policy, which had been initially 20% um, to 10% given the um, higher than anticipated projections. So we, we could cover uh, the obligations we had uh, that were um, outlined under those um, and they're in that category, uh, I think, much more quickly than had been anticipated. And specifically, the um, endowment for the Seattle College's 13th Year Promise Scholarship Program and the $1.5 million for job retraining and placement programs for workers who may be adversely impacted by the tax. And I understand. Yes. The, so the discretionary flexibility from 20 to 10, that's um, like during the budget process that we can play around with all the other revenue streams, whether it's city light SPU or general sub fund, but for this particular fund, we could only modify that within 10% as opposed to right. a higher so, amount. Well, so initially the in the original ordinance, so there was 20% had been allocated to these uh, one-time or limited term expenditures and then 80% to the ongoing programs. Right. And so that had been based upon the conservative um, projections of, you know, making sure that we we can cover the um, 5 million endowment for the Seattle College's uh, 13th Year Promise Scholarship and the 1.5 million for the job retraining as well as the one-time cost for administering the tax. Okay. So there, there was that kind of allocation. And then um, because the money was more than anticipated, the revenue was greater than anticipated, they could lower that 10%. Okay. Uh, the portion that went to the community-based fund, the, um, the, I can't remember the name of the group, the, uh, what's the name of the group that had some discretionary funds? The CAB. The CAB, yeah. I'm sorry. The CAB members, I didn't mean to offend you. Um, <laughs> that... How does this 10% proposal affect the amount that goes to the, the cab? So that was in the big... More or less or... So what had happened was when the... Um, the the tax went into effect and then we began collecting revenues. But there was also the idea of um, creating the cab to help provide recommendations, but they we had not that had not they had not been appointed yet, the members to the cab. So the thought was was that um, there was initial um, kind of take of okay, we have this certain, you know, the projections, we're going to allocate a certain way, but we're going to hold, I think it was about 2.7 million right. um, for this body to allocate as they see fit once they are fully up and running. Right. And so that, that was then what they did. And so that, that happened last year was that that 2.7 million was then distributed as the CAB had a request, had recommended. And so, but then the idea was that ongoing, the CAB would provide as, 
um, we have heard that kind of every year recommendations on how the SBT revenues be allocated. So it was the idea was that they were going to provide recommendations to the council and the mayor on how the how all of the revenue shall be allocated over time. So there isn't a reserve every year for the cab. It's more like they are um, recommending. And in this case, they have made recommendations about the unallocated revenues. And um, so there's, yeah. So let me see what I'm process. hearing then. So the 2.7 we set up um, for them to have some discretionary use. Moving forward, they will have, they'll have an advisory role on the full fund, but Three years from now, they're not getting another 2.7, another 2.7, new 2.8. That they just get to advise. That's so we're not earmarking a correct. sub fund for them yes. in the future. Okay. Yes. I didn't realize that. I thought that the way we had set this up, that in perpetuity they would always have their discretionary fund outside of it. Mm -hmm. But that was uh, short-lived to 2.7. Yeah, it's okay. just Thank the one time. You. Okay. Thanks, Yolanda. And just to clarify, we only recommend, we've never had full power over any of the funds, and so we recommended for those 2.7 and now making recommendations for all of the funds. See, that would, uh, I had a misunderstanding of that. See, I thought the way we had set that up was that that 2.7 was for the community to decide and we'll play around the other and look at our parts. I didn't realize that that was just, again, a recommendation. I thought it was yet more power, if you will, on that. Councilmember Brand. Yeah, I mean, my... Um, my take on all this was that uh, we were going to start collecting revenue in that first year um, while we were still establishing the, the um, community advisory board. And so, um, and we didn't want to not make investments while that board was being formed and, and working together. And so, based on the guidelines that we had set for the CAB, in um, the legislation said, we well, here are a chunk of things that we think we want to do, and then we'll leave some, uh, a pool of money likely to be for the latter half of the year for the CAB to recommend. But in future years, um, the CAB would be able to give us advice on the entire budget because they will have been formed at that point. And that's what you spoke to today was, right. was not just a chunk of it, but here are the sets of investments that we think you should consider. Um, in time for the mayor to consider the, the mayor's budget and for us to consider. And I sure. imagine we will see you and members of the CAB throughout the budget process talking about what your expectations are. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yep. Good. So, a question? Yeah, just really um, wanted to clarify the, on pages two through three of your memo, Yolanda, you sort of lay out the SBT re revenues that supplanted general funds um, and then listed out the programs. And um, the programs that I'm focusing in on are the Parent Child Home Program, the Child Care Assistance Program, um, and the Child Care Program, and the Nurse Family Partnership. And I just, um, and those are high priorities um, for me and I think for the City Council in general. And I guess I'm, I'm what I don't see in the memo and what I'm not tracking very clearly is if Council Member O'Brien's proposed changes would eliminate funding for these three programs, four if you include CCCP. So the, I, I, well, I don't, I think the intention is, is that, um, well, there, there are options obviously that can be taken, but the intention is that, that we, there would not, there would potentially be other funding for these programs um, where, where the supplantation had occurred, right? So that um, is about 5.7 million um, that had happened last year. And so the, so that would of course require finding additional revenue sources or cuts, um, but it would not be about, you know, so I think that we're just, we're just identifying where the money, where the supplantation had occurred, but um, it would not necessarily cut it. I think the, yeah, I, I don't want to speak for the well, No, I mean, member. I think the, te the <laughs> well, technical yeah, I mean, answer I, yeah, is that, and I'll I give you my policy can, answer in a second. Right. I mean, there's a difference between the intent and what the bill actually does, and you drafted the bill, so I want to know what does the bill do? Right. So the, the bill would not cut the funding at, at this point. I, so I think it kind of accepts what has happened to this date, to date. Um, now, if say there's a uh, supplemental budget that comes in for this year that does supplantation that it, um, after the effective date of the ordinance, then 
you know that there will that that would be it, um, counter to the spending policy of no supplantation of uh, general fund, but um, it, it does not undo what has been. It's not retroactive. Well, yeah, I know it's not retroactive because we've already spent the money. Um, so <laughs> unless we're planning on billing people, have them pay pay us back, um, I don't see that as an option. But. I, I mean, I suppose it, it, my recollection, and you know, I would have to go back to read the the um, enabling ordinance. But my understanding is that these programs were within the spending um, uh, intent to begin with. So I'm not, so I'm not tracking why they would be on the chopping block um, with sort of the understanding that, or sort of the theory that they somehow are outside of the contours of what is acceptable expenditures. No, well, so none of these programs were outside of the acceptable expenditures. I don't, I, that was not, the issue was not that. It was the issue that some of these were supported by general fund um, up until, and then um, the SBT was used to free up that general fund for other priorities. Right, and, because we created a sugary beverage tax in order to fund stably these programs. In part, these programs. Well, so Councilman O'Brien. Yeah, my my intent on okay. creating the sugary beverage tax was to augment these programs, um, and so we said, you know, there are programs that already exist that are doing work around um, healthy food access and um, uh, and, and early education mm -hmm. and and thirteen year promise too, um, and we want to do more of that. And so, because that's going to support these communities that are impacted by the, 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 the sweetened beverage tax, they're disproportionately impacted. And so, you know, we go and collect a bunch of money, and my intent, um, I think it's pretty clear in the legislation, the original legislation, was that this would be additive. But what happened during the budget process was they said, well, we're going to spend this money on these things that are allowed, these types of programs, but then we're going to take the general fund money that was previously used to fund it and spend it somewhere else. Um, and we don't know exactly where that was spent, um, but that, um, that's the, the problem I have, is that um, we said to community members, yes, certain communities, you know, Tanika, the people you were talking to on the doors in your community, yes, you know, to the extent you're consuming sweetened beverages, you're going to pay more for those because of this tax we're implementing. But the programs that. you're getting access to, whether it's Fresh Bucks or a preschool program, there will be more spots because we're adding money to that. And that's not, that is not what happened. Mm -hmm. They took that and said, we're going to take some of that money and use it to fund other programs. I don't know exactly what programs they were. I think loosely it was probably homeless, but we can't really track the color of money once it left that door. Right. Um, and that's the challenge is that um, we added, we collected, you know, 20 plus million dollars disproportionately from certain communities, but we didn't increase spending for those communities by 20 million dollars. So if I apply that intent, one is um, I appreciate that clarification because I wasn't, that wasn't clear to me from the text of this memo. Um, and so I was, I was concerned that what we were talking about was either maintaining this minimal funding or, um, or utilizing other funds besides sugary beverage tax to continue to fund these programs, which would be a major concern of, of mine. Um, but to apply your theory, um, so in other words, if we look at the parent-child ho home program, which is within the contours of acceptable expenditures for the sugary beverage tax revenue, we spent $1.113 million on that, correct? Mm -hmm. And so the question is, is how much more should we have spent on that, but for the fact that there was this um, general fund supplantation uh, gimmick that was used? Correct. Okay. And do we know sitting here today what that number should have been, but for that um, budget gimmick? Um, I I don't. It's okay, to, it's okay to say no. No, I, I don't <laughs> think so. I mean, I think uh, the CAB had some recommendations on how the allocation should have um, been last year, um, and um, you know, and including the programs that had been supplanted, it was kind of roughly. I remember, if I recall, like you might, you will have a better sense of your recommendations and how they matched up with uh, the actual budget, but. 
Um, so I, I don't think it was to the detail, you know, to the detail of the exact programs, but there was kind of a general distribution that had been hoped for with the full amount, not expecting the supplantation. I was at that. Asking meeting. Allie to join us as well. Thank you very much. Hi, Ali Panucci, Council Central Staff. I just thought I would uh, jump in here. I don't have all the details of the numbers in front of me, but I think in the, the simplest form, had the supplantation not happened, that $1.13 million of sweetened beverage tax that was used to supplant could have been used to expand. So I think if you look at all of that as the money that was used to supplant the general fund funding instead could have been used to grow those programs is one way of thinking about it. <clears throat> the challenge is that um, the other programs that would have needed to be cut in order to achieve that because the we were still trying to fill a funding gap from for other programs. I mean, and, and can you describe a little bit about what those other programs were? I know we talk about permanent supportive mm -hmm. housing, but I think it's going to be really important for us to get into the detail about what this bill would do, um, and particularly when we have an endorsed budget last year. I, I know all of us want, we have the same values here. We want to support these programs, and my my concern at this moment is to make sure that we've got all of the detail on where the money went last year and what other programs might have to either be cut back or eliminated if we move forward. I think um, off the off the top of my head, I can't identify specific programs. But we what we can do is look at. Um, programs that were funded with one-time funds in 2018 and 2019 and th highlight those as potential areas that would need to be eliminated because in some cases um, council is in a difficult situation during budget of wanting to fund a variety of programs. We are only able to identify one-time cuts or a one-time revenue source. So for that year, the budget is adopted um, to fund a program that really will need ongoing resources with, with one-time funds. So I think in, in, the, in the context of this conversation for the sweet and beverage tax, I think that the, and correct me if I'm wrong, Councilman Burr O'Brien, the thinking is, is to not go back and try to unwind everything that was done in 2019, but moving forward to make sure that additional programs that are currently funded with other resources aren't, be, sweet and beverage tax isn't being used to fund those existing programs and instead are only being used to expand programs that are already funded with street and beverage tax revenues or to fund new programs that are consistent with the policies outlined in the street and beverage tax Please, and fund ordinance. Um, thank you, Ali and Yolanda. This, this is definitely, um, uh, we're digging deep into the complexity of the budget and we're, um, it's hard for me because I haven't, uh, I haven't turned my budget brain part of that on that what? comes on at the end of September. All That's <laughs> on all year long. All the time. Okay. Um, I want to go back to kind of the root of my concern because I think we've touched on some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we, <laughs> it's hard to tell because it's it all you know once it becomes general fund money it just goes in a pool and no one says which you know did this come from property tax or did this come from sales tax or did this come from bno tax whatever it was but we know that there's a lot of needs within the community and um uh, and so and the mayor and we have challenging challenges to meet those needs um we can use permanent supportive housing as an example if you like i, I don't know to, if it's it would be appropriate to say but those are probably types of programs that may have been funded in part by one-time funding before and they're looking for sustainable solutions um that is a, a budget challenge that we have and will have going forward and we absolutely need to struggle with that to figure out what is the best way to do that it may be that we have to cut programs or it may be that we need to raise additional revenues my perspective of what happened last year is we chose to raise additional revenues and we raised those additional revenues by using the sweet and beverage tax which was a we knew was a disproportional tax on low-income communities and communities of color and that's the heartburn that i have is that um those if, if we need additional revenues to pay for these you know the people that are consuming um uh more more coke because, uh, and Pepsi, because they're marketed to or live in neighborhoods that don't have access to healthy alternatives, shouldn't be disproportionately responsible for solving the homeless crisis 
um, to fund it. Exactly. If we want to fund the homeless crisis, if we need more money for permanent supportive housing, that's a hard call for us. We'll have to go find revenues, but let's find a tax source that is more equitable than this. The only reason I supported the sweet and beverage tax was because we would be investing that back in those communities along the guidelines that we laid out here. And when the supplantation happened last year, um, I felt, and I largely because I heard from community members who felt that, hey, this was not what we sold to our community members when we said you should support this tax on you. Um, but it's okay because, well, it's a tax on you. You're going to get more benefits back through fresh bucks, through early education, through food banks, whatever that, that set of investments is. And that's, that's not what's happening. So I, you know, the intent of this legislation is to go back and honor that. Um, there's language in there that talks about supplantation. It's, it's a little bit tricky on how we do that, but I think the language in there is as strong as it can be. Um, and that leaves other budgetary challenges. How do we find enough general fund budget to fund all the programs we have, including the base amounts of some of the things we're talking about here? And that's what I think we're asking the mayor to do today is as you're forming your budget for 2020, um, don't take from the sweet and beverage tax, figure out other sources. If you have to make, make cuts here and there to do that and that's what you want to propose to us, then we'll consider that. If you want to find additional revenues um, somewhere else, um, we will also consider that. I will say right now, if those revenues are disproportionately falling on low-income people to fund broad uh, citywide initiatives, I'm unlikely to support that. Um, but that is what the mayor's job is between now and September 25th. And then we take over that job for the following six weeks and come to some conclusion. Thank you for that. Any other comments? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would just, I would, um, I would just say that, you know, for me, it, it, it's really important to make sure that when we're talking about the expenditures, um, we are acknowledging the commitments that we made um, when we all voted in favor of this. That um, that we recognize that this was a regressive tax that was disproportionately going to impact low-income communities, primarily communities of color, um, throughout the city. Um, but, uh, and that, you know, as a result of acknowledging that disproportionality, we had an obligation to reinvest the dollars back into the impact, the, the most disproportionately impacted community members. Um, I, I share the, the uh, concerns that Council Member O'Brien has expressed with regard to what appears to be a diversion from that commitment and that intent. Um, that was originally laid out when we first uh, legislated this um, uh, this particular tax um, and would like to see a path for us to get back on the right track in terms of how we are going to fulfill that commitment to um, community. And I would also say that when we're talking about the supplantation issues, um, you know, I think it's really important for us to be clear about what... Um, the impact of this um, bill as proposed by Council Member O'Brien will have on some of the policies that I see as uh, some of the programs as I see clearly within the rubric of commitments that we made to community, right? And it is very clear that the individuals who um, greatly benefit from programs like the Nurse Family Partnership Program, the Child Care Assistance Program, and the Parent Child Home Program are the same exact um, populations that are being disproportionately taxed in this area. And so, um, you know, I feel strongly that that we need to continue to make really clear that we're not backing away from those investments, that in fact what we're doing is wanting to protect um, those investments as sort of one of the priority investment areas that we considered and debated and made policy choices about during the deliberations of the sugary beverage tax. And um, so I was a little concerned when we first started this conversation that there was some moving away from those programs that created anxiety for me. Uh, and so having a better understanding of the true intent here is really, um, really helpful. Yeah, and I would like to apologize because I assumed that we were all on that same page mm -hmm. and understood that I've, I was speaking about being able to reach 2,000 families when there's actually 122,000 families mm -hmm. who need that assistance. Yeah. And taking away from that revenue really did not help um, what we were trying to yeah. do. Yeah. Please, Council President Hero. I'll simply say I didn't hear anything that Councilmember O'Brien said that I disagreed with. Mm -hmm. I fully agreed with everything you said. It's sort of simple as yeah. that. So. so my interest going forward is going to be to really understand, acknowledging the commitments that we made in last year's budget, what programs might be cut 
or what are we going to have to backtrack on that we had committed to last year? And I don't know that at this point. If it turns out that we have a lot more money than we anticipated and we can fulfill all of the commitments that we made last year, I'm going to feel good about moving forward with that. At this point, I'm not sure what programs were supported by the money that was actually supplanted. What are those programs with specificity? I'm going to ask Yolanda um, and Allie to work with me if we know. And if we don't know, then we need to ask the um, budget office for that so we've got a real clear commitment. I think I, I would just note that it was, it was anything funded with the general fund frankly. So the, the choices in terms of what is not funded or finding a new revenue source would really be anything that was funded with general, I'm going to call it general, general fund because the sweet and beverage taxes <laughs> is, is also was in the general fund. And I think, I think that therein lies the challenge is that we can identify all of uh, programs that were funded with one-time ads or cuts and that might help narrow the universe of, of programs. But I think the hard the good and the bad is that it is anything that was funded with the general fund. Yeah, it seems to me that the irony here is that the the question posed by Councilmember Bagshaw is the question that we're all struggling with, but is the one question we can't answer because we don't have a dedicated right. fund that allows right. us to do that kind of accounting and the tracking. So that's, to me, that's the the irony of the situation and the conversation. And I think the, the, the reality is, is that we have to make difficult decisions and budgets all of the time. Um, in this context, we made those difficult decisions when we considered the creation of the sugary beverage tax and defined clearly what the investment priorities were going to be. So anything that was funded outside of those spending priorities as adopted by the city council, um, are, are the things that were likely inappropriately funded. So inappropriately? Yeah, I mean, that were, that were inappropriately funded in the sense of it fell outside of the rubric of what we said the sugary beverage tax revenue could be used for. So, I mean, I think, I think, it, I think it's almost you have to inverse it and say like, what are the things that we did fund based on the revenue? Were they funded at the appropriate level, but for supplantation? If the answer is no, they weren't funded at the appropriate level, but for the supplantation, then it, it almost doesn't matter what other things were funded because we know that the things we said we were going to fund didn't get funded. We're, yeah, those programs. So. And so I, I um, if I Please. can jump in, I, yeah. um, Councilmember Bagshaw, it, it would be, uh, I think the question you ask is a very appropriate question, and I don't know that there's a real answer for that or that we're ever going to get one. I mean, I think um, my sense is the answer is that's the budget process. It is the entire budget document that shows all the mix of things we spent on, and there's no way. I mean, you know, the mayor could come forward and say, no, th those specific dollars went to this program, um, and that may be accurate or not, but it's, but it's somewhere in the budget, and we don't really know, and it all got mixed together. Um, my concern, again, is that we made a commitment, or at least I made a commitment, to community members that we were going to tax them, but that that tax would be dedicated to additional investments in their community, and we didn't do that. Um, again, I want to be clear, the, the, mayor, the mayor didn't go, you know, buy a new car with this money. She's investing in other things that we really care about. Right. I just don't think it's fair to tax these particular community members um, to make those investments. And... I, we could sit here and talk about this for the next four months, but I don't think we're going to get any more clarity. And the question I'm asking my colleagues to consider is, if you agree that this population that's disproportionately taxed by the sweet and beverage tax should not be funding the broader funding, then let's put that money in a bucket and reserve for the general budget. You know, we will have plenty of hard discussions during the budget, as will the mayor as she proposes the budget, but let's take this pool of money off limits for that. And I, you know, I really appreciate you all being here today. I appreciate you being here um, a couple weeks ago. I appreciate your um, ongoing engagement for the months before. I, I really want to do whatever I can to let these people get back to doing their work and not keep dragging them back here. They're, the question before that they're asking me is, and in the next panel too, 
this money was intended for us. Do we have to come here and keep defending it? And I want to say, no, we want to block that off. We'll have a big budget fight over you know, what else we want to fund in a couple months. Um, but let's block this money off today and let these people get back to work. Mm -hmm. And we'll resolve that other questions as we work through the budget. Good. And I just, I'm going to um, end this because we have other items uh, and we will continue this conversation. Just getting fun. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, first of all, I want to completely respect and say I appreciate so much um, the heart that I hear from you and have heard from you all along, Councilmember O'Brien. You are committed to living up to your promise, so I want you to know that I appreciate that. Where I'm coming from is not inconsistent with that, but I feel that we made some commitments to our budget last year. I want to know what that is. If it's permanent supportive housing, if it's the nurse family partnership, if any of that is going to be implicated, I want to hear from our budget office, but we can do that after today. Um, so, Council President Harrell, do you want to put any final words on no, this? No, I'm just, I, again, I'm fully supportive of what you're trying to do. And, and, and I, quite frankly, I think we all sort of felt that when we articulated. I had a lot of hard burn to, to even support the tax. And then because of what you said is where this money, that's why I was so passionate about the 13th year, the 13th year program. Is, is near and dear to me because quite candidly black and brown people are the beneficiaries of that the impediments of going to to a school and so that was real those are real dollars they were in, only for five years by the way but i figured we can get the program up and running and then we could figure out other ways to do it so, so sort of I, I like the concept of that sort of sacred money so to speak that we're going to really try to pump back into the community and so but We'll probably have some arguments about, you know, uh, you know, Councilman Gonzalez, for example, mentioned uh, child care assistance program and nurse family partnerships. Certain council members were just passionate about that bucket too, in a, in a good way. Uh, but I like the concept of um, of keeping it in the community, quite candidly. Mm -hmm. and I think we all sort of articulated that. Well, so. The ordinance states <laughs> where the money is supposed to yeah. go. Councilmember Bagcha, I. Um, I would love to get a sense on timing on this because I, I'm ready to, to vote on this and at least lock down where the money that's collected from the sweet and beverage tax goes because whether that, whether that money is being used for permanent support of housing or um, you know, more public safety or expanded community service or uh, community center hours, uh, regardless of what you put on that list, I'm going to say, no, it should not go for it if it's not on the list. And so I don't need to we're, fill in that We're blank. committed to bringing this forward on July 10th for a vote. Okay. So um, I have signaled multiple times here, we will continue to look at what would not be spent or what programs would be defunded or reduced if we move forward in 2020. Uh, if you're talking about wanting to make sure we've got the ordinance in place in 2021 and thereafter, we still need to consider about what that looks like. But um, I okay. think we've got two weeks. Um, and we'll vote on, we'll vote out of committee on July 10th. I appreciate that commitment. And I don't, I, just to be clear, I, we can ask the mayor what she will defund, but I think we'll hear that on September 25th or no, what, but, she, what she finds additional revenue agreed, for. Agreed, but I really would like us to have um, some information about that by within two weeks so that we're not just left with somebody saying, oh, you've got a $5 million hole um, in October. You know, we need to be thinking about this as we're going forward. So we'll have this opportunity in the next two weeks um, to have more clarity from the budget office about what the implications are. And, and what happens if the city budget office doesn't provide us a satisfactory answer? We have um, an opportunity to make our decision then. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, really respect all of the work you're doing. Uh, and again, I just want to acknowledge that you know, Councilmember O'Brien, you're pushing this for all the right reasons. Can, can I ask one clarifying question just to central staff? The EDI, I'm sorry. I no, sorry. So the EDI money, the Equitable Development Initiative or funding, n none of that, I remember we had some one time. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that. But what I was going to ask was n none of, I thought part of your proposal was some of it would go toward that. But during the first round, we came up with that money from one-time sales of other property. It's like 15 million or something like that. Go ahead. I, I have two separate ordinances. Okay, so that's and the next ordinance okay, we'll discuss right. is about okay, EDI. Thank but, you. but okay, I've talked about them out of the same side of my mouth okay, multiple okay. times. Okay, so. okay, that was confusing so, me on so that this that. one we here. Haven't quite got that. Okay, yeah. gotcha. All right, thank okay. you. So thank you for coming. And um, if you'd like to read in the next item, which is EDI, I thank would you. ask the next panel to come up. Thank you. Item number three, Council Bill 119402, an ordinance related to funding for the Equitable Development Initiative and affordable housing, creating a fund for short-term rental tax revenue. 
and I believe we have Colleen Echo Hawk was, oh, she's in the back. Nora? <laughs> and Allie again? Yeah. You're here. <laughs> Thank you. I just, Colleen, welcome. Thank you. Happy and we have Nora? Yeah, and I think Nora has a time constraint, so we might want to start with Okay, I think. Oh, wait Okay. She got through security. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> that was made it. Well, real life. You do that. Yeah. Well, here. Just walk around. Live. <laughs> All right. So, um, Allie, why don't you introduce yourself, Colleen, and Nora will go right down the line. <clears throat> Allie Panucci, Council Central Staff. Colleen Echohawk, Chief Seattle Club. Uh, Nora Yunus, African Women Business Alliance. Thank you. Okay. So. <coughs> Do you want to introduce this or shall we do what we did last time, which is to start with Colleen and just talk about um, the implications for you, what you're planning to do with money. Con congratulations again for Thank your you. Chief Seattle Club and the Lazarus Day Center construction project. Um, we're very excited to be partners with you on that. Well, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm um, really honored to be at this table again to tell you about our project and to really um, highlight how the EDI fund has been so important for us. Just some uh, setting of the context is that, as you all know, American Indian Alaska Native people have the highest rates of homelessness in our city. The last point in time count, which was a more accurate account than our past counts have been, that's a whole nother topic, um, showed us that 10% of the population of our, with in our homeless population, yet we make up less than 1% of our total population. So that race disparity is highly incredible. Um, I believe it is disheartening and something that we as our city should do better at. And so um, I'm happy to talk about the EDI funds and how that has um, created an opportunity for us to um, really provide housing for our, our, for our native community that is experiencing homelessness. Um, the EDI funding um, came to us and it was um, a surprise. It was something that we weren't, um, we didn't know very much about. And I just wanted to um, honor the people who have um, initiated this much way before I was ever involved. Involved. And they had the foresight to recognize that the displacement, displacement was happening and happening quickly. And um, they set up a beautiful fund for us. Um, of course, it is way limited because it's not as, the dollars are not as much as we'd like them to be. However, for our project, a small organization like the Chief Seattle Club that did not have a huge amount of assets, it was incredibly helpful for us to get going. We received $750,000 of that funding um, that went all to pre-development. And that was so essential for us because we just did not have the experience. Um, we had the gutsiness and we had the passion to like move forward because we knew that we had to do something. But those dollars were um, just imperative. We just wanted to say huge thanks to um, OPCD who worked with us um, to try to figure out how how to get us the dollars. So that was hard because we hadn't done this kind of work before. Um, I'm really excited to say that we go to construction in November. So we will be um, creating this beautiful building of 80 units of housing. One thing we really love about the building is that we believe it'll be one of the first buildings in our downtown quarter that's named um, uh, a Lushutsi name. So it'll be the all, all building, which means home. And we hope everyone thinks and talks about that name because that is part of, of, of changing what has been the norm in Seattle for the past many years. Um, and English has been the prominent language, but part of equity in our city is to understand that we are in, a Coast Sal in the Coast Salish territories. Um, I could talk to you forever about this project and I've, I've talked to almost <laughs> everyone. I will be um, in Council Member Pachango's office soon. So um, you'll hear more from me on Friday. <laughs> Um, but I just want to thank everyone around the table and especially Councilmember Bagshaw for your continued support and love for the project. We just see it and feel it. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Colleen, can yeah. you um, really, I'm really excited about your yeah. project. Um, and I know it's been years in the making. This is awesome. Yeah. Um, the, the EDI money gets mm -hmm. paired with Office of Housing and other mm -hmm. resources to build this whole project. Yeah. But the EDI money 
what piece, it's typically not going towards the housing itself, but there are other, what, what, mm -hmm. what part of the project is it, is it funding for your for project? For us, it was funding the early um, architecture um, issues we had, right? We had to like understand the site. So we did geo surveys, we did water um, surveys. We had to use it, you know, we wanted to build a basement in Pioneer Square. Well, we used those dollars to realize, bad idea. <laughs> um, we're not gonna do a basement in Pioneer Square. Um, and so we use those dollars to um, get all the pre-development work, you know, um, um, done, and um, it has been huge. The other thing I'd say too is it helped us with just capacity. Our organization has grown, so seventy-five thousand of it was just let's get Chi Seattle Club um, staffed up appropriately to do this project because it is, you know, a big undertaking. But um, it's also, I think that what is um, amazing about this funding too is that people of color organizations that have not um, been really have not been allowed to by government to build housing, this is um, remarkable because we're doing it. And it's, um, I had a, a, a friend who's done a lot of development and said, Colleen, it's not rocket science. And I, I always hear that in the back of my head. Yeah, that we, we have the knowledge, the ancestral knowledge as well to know how to do this. Thank you. And um, I just cannot um, heap enough praise on you uh, and your board for the work that you've done. And I also want to acknowledge how much support you've gotten from Pioneer Square, from your neighbors, from people that are there. Uh, and also I want to say thanks to SDOT. Um, I appreciate the fact that SDOT has been willing to look at the whole Fortson Square and the approach because one of the things you told me early on was that you wanted to be able to use that property out front as a community gathering space, a welcoming space, uh, and also um, as essentially a job training opportunity if you had the cafe, if you were able to sell native jewelry on site. It, yeah. it is that kind of development we're talking about. So well done. And Thank I'm, you. I'm we're excited. excited about how things are going. Thank you. Um, would you like to proceed, please? Yes, please. Um, I'm so honored to be here as well. Um, and kudos to saying ancestral language, I mean, power to the community. Um, I'm coming from African Women Business Alliance. We are strength-based, data, mission, and community-driven for focused full uh, black women diaspora in business. Our mission is to provide black women diaspora with holistic approach and culturally responsive tools required to start, to grow, and scale a business through a holistic approach uh, model that focuses on training, one-on-one -on -one coaching, marketplace, and seed capital. Um, and I cannot, uh, I personally, as a founder and executive director of African Women Business Alliance, I was on the verge of giving up when this funding came to us. Just like you, surprise. <laughs> I was not expecting it um, because it was mainly uh, self-funded and I mainly started it because I saw a tremendous amount of potential in my community, not just Somali community, but I'm talking about African black women diaspora who have been doing businesses for years in this city, but they stay stagnant. Um, and for me, um, from an equitable lens, that is unacceptable because we live in the most beautiful, progressive city as Seattle. Um, but Talking about the Equitable Development Fund and what it did so far, it has helped us, it, it gave us two things. The stability to remain <laughs> on the course, um, push forward, um, and really rely on the resilience and strength of our community and use that to move us forward. And another thing it did was to really um, instill the faith that I have and we have with the board and the community members themselves that for us to, for us to close both gender and racial gap in business development for black women diaspora, we have to work authentically and intentionally with other service providers, with our institutions um, currently in progress, um, financial institutions, academic institutions, and the funding that comes from the city does give us that faith that we're not alone. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a, I don't wanna say small because it has done tremendous amount of um, uh, benefit to us. Uh, we got funded through the capacity building, so we received 75K. Um, in partnership with, uh, for Marketplace, in partnership with uh, Muslim Women Business Network. So that's currently in progress. We decided to have our own Marketplace and they will also fund their own Marketplace because they're really based on the North End as well. And our demographics, so far, it's, um, it's, it's a bit diverse. So we want to make sure that they get the strength they need to be able to do the Marketplace and we want to get the strength that we need to do that. Um, but so far, the funding has really benefited us in hiring our program manager for the first time, being able to fund my uh, salary as well because I worked for free almost for two years. Um, and what else? Our market, sorry, our commercial space for black women owned businesses in Seattle. So that's currently in, in progress and we're working to make sure that we get that at some point. Excellent. Mm -hmm. 
can't remember. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Be sorry, can I add something? Absolutely. Um, one of the best things that we, we are currently doing so far right now, I'm um, talking about closing both gender and racial gap, is really sharing the narrative of black women in business. And we realize that, yes, we can do technical support, yes, we can focus on hiring people, but honestly speaking, from doing this work and from my own personal experience as a black African woman, diaspora or immigrant and a mother, is that people are not aware of the value black women diaspora are bringing to the table. And thankfully, we got 10K from the funding to be able to develop a beautiful a short film that is going to take, uh, we're going to show it in October sometime, um, in partnership with Diego Lynch, um, who's our great filmmaker. And we're able to tell these stories um, and talk about data, because we are really focused on data, talk about gentrification, because majority of our women members have been gentrified. It's been so sad, like, sometimes I find myself crying dealing with these women who, like, I've dealt with them five months, and then you go visit them, they're gone. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the problem is rapidly increasing, and we don't have enough capacity or resources, rather, to, like, address things. However, collectively, I do have the hope that um, somehow we can come to some equitable conclusion. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? Councilmember O'Brien. If I could just jump in before Ali starts, because I really appreciate um, the two of you being here today and talking about how you've accessed the Equitable Development Initiative funding. Um, the anti-displacement, and I also really appreciate that the um, that um, EDI came in a, at a time that it was like, wow, this is an amazing resource, and the people have been doing, trying to find these sources for years. And there's, there's been some amazing work that helped inform the council getting behind this. Mm -hmm. um, the anti-displacement work um, takes so many forms in our city, and I think it's really easy for me to lose sight of what that always looks like. Um, affordable housing is a huge piece of that because we know people are being displaced because they can't live here. Um, and we have a bunch of tools for that. Not enough. We need more. Um, but it's not the only reason uh, and the only tool we need to have. And the way you have both described here today as this flexible pool of funding um, that can support housing like it did for the Chief Seattle Club, but can also support other um, initiatives that are anti-displacement initiatives mm -hmm. um, is really is, is really just great to hear and great for me to kind of internalize too. So thank you for that. Thank you. Ali, do you want to address some of the financial issues here? Sure. So I will um, describe Council Bill 119402 that would establish a fund and financial policies for the short-term rental tax revenues and describe, describe some potential options for the committee's consideration. And thankfully, this is a little more straightforward than the previous um, revenue source. As was discussed at committee on June 12th, the original t intent uh, for the short-term rental tax was to generate ongoing funding for the equitable development initiative for grants made to communities. And the goal was to generate at least $5 million that would be available for grants. So as Council President Harold mentioned, originally the equitable development initiative grant funding was provided with one-time funding from the um, with the interfund loan from based on the sale of the property across the street. This, then um, following that, there was a commitment that the council would identify an ongoing revenue source and that led to development of the short-term rental tax. Um, the um, so the initial intent was to support equitable de development initiative um, project grants and then as a secondary goal to provide additional resources generally for affordable housing and to provide a resource to pay the debt service on the bonds that were issued for affordable housing. The spending plan in the 2019 and 2020 budget supported several council priorities, broadly speaking, related to EDI and affordable housing. However, the proposed budget swapped um, short-term rental tax proceeds for general, rent, general fund resources to fund office, uh, the Office of Planning and Community Development staffing and consultant services that were pre previously supported by general fund dollars. Um, with some expansion and um, to direct money to support permanently supportive housing operations and maintenance and a rental assistance programs. These swaps, while were consistent with general council priorities, were not consistent with the original intent for this revenue source. In response to the mayor's proposed 
budget, Council Bill 11942 was introduced last fall during the budget deliberations to create the fund and adopt the policies that would have, would have restricted use of those funds. However, because the council was unable to find the ongoing resources to fully ally, align the proposed spending plan with the original intent, and at the request of the central budget office, the council did not act on the bill at that time and instead adopted um, statement of legislative intent 1-5-B-1 that asked um, the budget office to prepare legislation and propose financial policies by March. Um, at that when that was due, instead of transmitting legislation, they submitted a letter um, suggesting that they agree that a fund should be established, but they would propose legislation when they transmit the budget in the fall of 2019. Um, because that legislation wasn't transmitted, Council Member O'Brien requested that central staff work to identify um, any necessary changes to Council Bill 119402 um, to allow Council to act on that legislation prior to budget deliberations and to establish policies um, beginning in 2020 and beyond. So what I have done in the memo is outline three potential options that Council could consider in modifications to Council Bill 119402. The three options would all establish a fund for short-term rental tax revenue so we could be clear about where those dollars are going and it would amend the bill as introduced to have it put in place in January 2020 rather than January 2019 since we passed that date. Um, the first option that is on pages four through eight of the bill, if you wanna see the details, would establish financial policies that direct spending of short-term rental tax revenues um, exactly the way it was originally intended when the council adopted the local tax. However, um, <clears throat> If adopted, the, it would be inconsistent with the 2020 endorsed budget, and it would require likely cutting resources for the um, uh, permanently supportive housing or finding additional cuts or revenues to support um, the ongoing operations and maintenance. It's about 3.3 million dedicated for that, as well as identifying about $1.1 million to provide um, funding for the staff and consultant services and OPCD. Option two, which is on page nine through 13 of the memo, would establish financial policies for 2020 that are consistent with the 2020 endorsed budget. So it would provide about $4 million for EDI grants. It would provide about $1 million to support staffing and consultant services and would continue to allow spending on permanently supportive housing um, and to pay the debt service on the bonds issued for affordable housing. And then beginning in 2021, um, it would go would go back to the policies that were in the original, um, that was the council's original intent. That would again require because the <laughs> the funding for permanently supportive housing um, is an ongoing need. It would require likely finding other resources at that time. Um, so there would it would essentially push the the challenge down the road and potentially provide more time to identify new um, revenue sources. Option three would, similar to option two, for 2020 would establish policies that are consistent with the 2020 endorsed budget for 2020. And in 2021 and beyond, the financial policies would first prioritize paying the debt service and bonds issued for affordable housing, direct the next $6.1 million in revenues to EDI. This would include $5 million for grants made to community and $1.1 million for staffing and consultant services. And then for anything above that would provide more flexible use of any excess revenues that could include um, additional funding for EDI grants, including the affordable housing component of those projects or to support affordable housing generally um, and, include it, and that could include um, payments for ongoing resources for operations and maintenance for permanently affordable housing. These could be you know, mix and match or additional options should be included, but I wanted to lay out some alternative approaches for the committee's consideration. Councilmember O'Brien, you want to dive in? Um, that actually is much more clear than, uh, it's much less complex, I just <laughs> yeah. say, than the last one. So I don't have much to add. I'll just, similar, um, I think that this, uh, these sets of investments, um, I, I can't remember the exact number, but um, I think there are over 20 applicants for the, the pool of money last year, and we funded a, a fraction of them. Um, and we know that every year 
uh, as more and more organizations get more and more familiar with this, I expect to see more and more applications for it. And so I imagine this is a pool that we would want to grow, not to shrink. And so, um, you know, I'm looking for support from my colleagues um, uh, and happy to have discussions between now and um, the 10th of July on how we can get as much money funding into this. It's a little, I mean, one of the tricky parts we're in right now is um, we really don't know what the, um, we don't know how much money we're going to receive from the short-term rental. Um, we're, we're receiving the money, but um, Ali, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the status of it. The, the data coming over is a little complicated and hasn't been totally digested yet, so we don't really know if we're on target, ahead of target, behind target. Yeah, so the um, state began collecting revenues at the beginning of this year, and it is, it's a uh, convention center tax, so it goes to the convention center, and then any money, any revenue generated in the city of Seattle comes to the city. So there is a delay in us knowing what the, the revenues look like. To date, um, I think initially, the the budget office had um, thought we might be looking at less revenue than we had originally projected. It looks like we um, think we are on track to stay or close to the $10.5 million that was proposed in the um, adopted 2019 and 2020 endorsed budget, but we really won't know until early next year um, how much revenue is generated and, you know, hopefully we'll all be pleasantly surprised and there will be excess revenues and that could <laughs> Um, help some of these problems, but going into discussions of the 2020 budget, we won't have um, enough information to really know if there'll be excess revenue. And so what, what my hope in that situation would be to do, so in last year's budget, um, uh, the, mayor, the, the proposed budget that came with the mayor only included $4 million for grants mm -hmm. um, and then a $1 million for, um, for staffing. Um, and we were able to boost up that $4 million to the $5 million in grants as, as committed um, without cutting anything else because we found, I think, community development block grant money, Correct. which is somewhat restricted and not great, but it got us yeah. through 2019 budget. Um, uh, there's a mix of proposals in here between your options, and I would be really interested in figuring out how we can uh, make sure for 2020 we can also get $5 million in grants. Um, and so that's a, a conversation that I would love to try to put some parameters around, um, you know, with this legislation, recognizing we may have to continue to work on that in the budget. Um, perhaps some version that talked about, you know, a chunk going to the bonding, a chunk going to what was in the 2020 endorsed budget, but then the next, you know, if in fact the revenues are coming in slightly higher than we think or above what we budgeted for, that that would go towards um, the EDI, the grants. EDI. Yeah. and then any surplus to go to that too. So I mean, that's an open question. If if it turns out, you know, because this is a relatively new revenue source that we still don't have our hands around, um, I would love to put some language in there that really strongly pushes, you know, any money above the five, the one point one, and the two point two, whatever that adds up to, mm -hmm. eight point three, maybe something like that, mm -hmm. seven point three. That, that, that sounds about right. <laughs> eight point three. What you know, if, if we get money above 8. that. To, to try to dedicate as much of that as possible to EDI because um, at least for the next few years, I think that's going to be a, an important source or important place to invest. Great. Anything else? We still have two more agenda items to move through today. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. You're thank you both for person. taking your time to come and join with us. And I wish you the best with all the work you're, that you're doing. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you. Thanks I've, for coming. I've uh, hit my word count for the day, so I'm going to excuse myself. Yeah, that was a lot for you. She's wearing more appropriate shoes today. <laughs> Very good. I can't see my toes. <laughs> I can't see your toes. All right. Um, would you like to read in the next item? Thank you. Item number four, Council Bill 119552, an ordinance related to Yesler Crescent Improvements, amending ordinance 125724, which adopted the 2019 budget, including the 2019-2024 capital improvement. Pro program. Excellent. Thank you. And Christopher Williams, welcome. Tracy Ratzliff, thank you so much for all of your help. So are you going to introduce it, Tracy? Surely I can. Tracy Ratzliff, Council Central Staff. So Council Members, uh, during the 2019-2020 budget discussions, uh, you added uh, about $470,000 of additional funds to the Yesler Crescent Improvement Project. This is a CIP project that was actually funded to the tune of about $500,000 by the executive in the 2019 budget. You uh, wanting to uh, understand perhaps how that $970,000 of total funding might be spent, put a proviso on that um, uh, money and asked for the Parks Department, the executive, uh, working with other departments as well in the community to come back 
with a proposed spending plan. And so what you have in front of you is the ordinance that releases the money and also attached to the fiscal note is a, um, a description of how the funds will be spent. Great. Thank you. It's one of the best summaries um, ever. And uh, Christopher, I'm going to pass it to you, but I want to acknowledge and say huge thanks to you and your team. You are always so gracious and have been very involved. Uh, and I also just want to say for my colleagues, this isn't just about parks. This is um, the King County building across the street. We've been working with them. DESC, uh, Sound Transit across the street. Big focus on the community engagement. But um, what you are doing in City Hall Park in Yesler Crescent is making a huge difference. Um, and I want to acknowledge that and say thank you. Thank you very much. So maybe I'll jump in there. Uh, we're proposing a set of intentional people-centered strategies uh, to make City Hall Park essentially work better. Uh, the strategies build on the success of the prior year. Uh, People-centered strategies focus on people versus our traditional focus on built environment. Uh, we want people to use the park. The goal is to create a vibrant, to create vibrancy in the park, uh, increase public use while increasing pub the public perception of safety. Research shows that people report feeling safe in parks when there's lots of activity, activity and activation going on. So uh, part of these expenditures are divided into uh, capital and operating. Uh, we will spend over the next two years roughly $306,000 uh, to invest in operations. That's activation and a whole series of things I'll go through later. And then over the next two years, we'll spend about $664,000 in capital investments in the park. Uh, so the first $58,000 will go to enhance activation in City Hall Park, including music, art, food trucks, the replacement of concrete benches and chairs. Uh, these features have already been improved by the Pioneer, Squ Pioneer Square Preservation Board. I should note that any changes to Yester Crescent or City Hall Park need to go through the Pioneer Preservation Board. Uh, this includes activation of the activation of Dillings Way, uh, we will feature eight lunchtime concerts uh, in the months of July and August. Uh, over the nine to ten weeks of activation, uh, we will be using uh, two well-worn tools to uh, get the public out, and that includes activation. As we look at kind of the hierarchy of what's effective, safety, safety enhanced maintenance and activation, we know that activation and bringing the public out works the best. So we'll leverage those tools against uh, creating a better public experience in City Hall Park. Uh, the second thing we'll spend money on is roughly $50,000 on enhanced site maintenance, including cleaning of the globes, uh, adding additional lighting, uh, tree pruning, and all of the enhanced maintenance features that is the other part of that three-legged stool. It was, um, this also includes revamping the lighting in the Jefferson Alley. Uh, this is the lighting that, uh, rather, this is the alley space between the park and the courthouse. We already have cafe-style lighting. The goal is to get more of that lighting, perhaps across the street to the uh, Sound Transit Station. And I'm told that we could have that in place as soon as next week or the week after. That is so great. And I really want to acknowledge Victoria Schoenberg, yeah. too. She's been um, wonderful at Absolutely. responding to questions. Your whole team, Christopher, has been great last summer when it first came up that we needed to be doing some things differently. Yeah. You had the trees pruned and yeah. those globes cleaned and King County colleagues there with Carolyn Whalen and our team of judges that were so worried about right. safety. Um, you've all really stepped up. Great can-do attitude by Lisa Nelson and uh, a bunch of folks at Parks. Uh, so the next tranche of funding will spend $75,000 uh, of King County levy money uh, to transfer money from King County levy to DON so that DON can work with the Pioneer Square Alliance to develop design guidelines for any future changes to City Hall Park or Prefontaine. Ultimately, again, any changes would need to go through the Pioneer Square Preservation Board. And can you talk a little bit about how that money, or maybe an, another category, a bucket of money, will be used with our friends with the Pioneer Square Alliance? Because I know they're putting in $100,000 that they've identified through a grant source. So how, how does this work together so yes. that we're not duplicating? So um, uh, that's kind of on the capital side. 
And um, we will work with, uh, in coordination with the Pioneer Square Alliance to explore options for connectivity and activation between City Hall Park and Prefontaine Fountain. Uh, this includes hiring a consultant to work with the Preservation Board. Uh, this funding uh, will support kind of a comprehensive look at options for Prefontaine Fountain uh, with a focus on connections and connectivity. I liken it to an example of moving furniture around in your living room to see how you create sort of the best uh, fit for people. Um, the idea is that what comes out of these recommendations will be funded as hard capital investments in 2020. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, moving right along here, uh, we will transfer $75,000 from the SPR operating budget to the Pioneer Square, I'm sorry, to DON to work with the Pioneer Square Alliance to map out those uh, design guidelines so they can connect with any physical changes we want to make down the road. Uh, we're also planning to assist in the public life study. Uh, this is another effort uh, being led by SDOT, uh, and it really looks at how people use public spaces in Pioneer Square. And uh, again, the idea is that recommendations that come out of the public life study could be funded next year with the $364,000. We're setting ourselves up to do that. Great, and I'd like to ag acknowledge um, Lena Tebow in my office and Brian Chu, who is working with okay. SDOT and your staff. Um, they got 43 volunteers awesome. to come out um, last month and do those public life study counts. Great. And it really is helping because we're, we have for the first time yeah. some data to know where people are and what's going on. Wonderful. Uh, so we'll work with SDOT to complete the public life study. We're actually transferring $50,000 to SDOT to complete that work. Uh, we're also looking at uh, Fortson Square planning and design. Uh, this is for SDOT and the Office of Arts and Culture to propose solutions for Fortson Square. Um, and then... Uh, Just to throw one more thing yeah. in your way, Colleen Echo Hawk and her design yeah. team have been fabulous. Been great. So we're there hand in hand with them. Yeah. And, and then I've mentioned the $364,000, which will be deferred to 2020 to implement recommendations out of the public life study. Great. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. So. All right. So anything else? No. Nope. Yep. All right. So... Um, any other questions from my colleagues? This has been really important uh, to me personally, and I thank you for your support. So I move that the committee pass Council Bill 119552. Second. Any questions? Discussion? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 And nobody's opposed, and there's no abstentions. Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks again, Tracy. Okay, our um, final item today, Bobby Humes. If you would please come up. How are you, buddy? How are you doing? Good. Doing Thanks fantastic. for being here again. Deputy Mayor Mosley, Ms. Deborah Smith, did you want to join? You're welcome to. Okay, very good. Thank you. Well, um, I suspect Deputy Mayor Mosley will start with you, and um, if both of you will um, give us your names for the record. But I do want to say thank you, Bobby. You answered supplemental questions from our last meeting. Um, I also appreciated your additional resume information because it's so rich with things that we all wanted to know. So thank you for doing that. My pleasure. Please. Thank you. Uh, yes, David Mosley, Deputy Mayor. Uh, just uh, nice to be back with you again. We had a, a robust discussion uh, at your last committee meeting and uh, very pleased to be back uh, before you today, again today to have Mr. Hume provide any supplemental responses that the council would like. I would like to simply uh, notify the council that uh, I've got a hard stop at four o'clock, so I may need okay. to pa pass out, uh, not, not pass out, but. <laughs> <laughs> I know you won't, but we'll, we'll excuse you, Thank you. in 17 minutes. Um, uh, Chair Bagshaw, I also have a hard stop at four o'clock, so I just wanted to let you know for okay. voting purposes. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. well, well, this may be the shortest meeting in a long time where we have talked with the director to be, but Lena, would you please read that in for me? Yes, item number five, appointment number 01370, appointment of Robert Humes as director of Seattle Department of Human Resources. <laughs> okay, well, why don't we just dive in, Bobby? Okay. Um, uh, because we had a wonderful meeting a couple of weeks ago where we 
uh, grilled you quite extensively on your background, and there were some additional questions, and I think that these are all have all been given to my colleagues. So um, I think when we last left it, uh, there had been some queries made about you know your um, the time uh, between jobs that you've had. Uh, my understanding, based upon people I've talked to, is that they say, yep, it's true that he changes jobs every two years, but it's because he's been so good, he has been tapped to move on into other jobs. So I don't know if the two of you would like to discuss that further, or, uh, but I think it'd be a good starting point. I, I think the, the sentiments of uh, the blessing I've had to be able to come into roles um, and make uh, critical impacts in timely fashion, uh, critical impacts that still create value in the places where I've worked um, and to be able to uh, uh, be selected uh, to compete for other opportunities has just been consistent. And you will note that um, uh, they're in systems. So um, as I move, I'm moving within a system, um, uh, specifically with the, the United States Army and then with the, the state of Washington. Um, and then even uh, my last role in another system at the Kent School District. And I know that you were working as HR director in our parks department yes. and were tapped by the mayor to come and take over as the interim director. Do you want to talk a little bit about what has your experience been in this interim role? Uh, absolutely. Uh, my experience in the interim role has um, been shaped by the, the opportunity that I see within the department uh, to leverage key skill sets that are already there. Um, we have a, a great customer service, uh, value-driven uh, approach to how we do work, and I think there's an opportunity to, to leverage um, a more inclusive action, uh, bringing more folks to the table as we make decisions to create that. Um, and so that's been my, my focal point also, is uh, to focus externally on how we're building partnerships um, across the city to do the work that we're required to do um, through the lens of, of race and social justice first. Um, and then to uh, couch our value in uh, project-driven, results-based work. Council President Harold, would you like to pursue any line of questioning from the last time? Uh, no, I'll just make a comment. I've had the pleasure of meeting with Mr. Humes um, separately between meetings, and I'm ready to su support him affirm affirmatively. I think I made my expectations very clear that I expect from this position and from him personally just to be a, a leader in inclusionary thinking and diversity. Uh, that part of the vision for our workforce and, and I think sort of tapping the potential of that office that has been probably underutilized mm -hmm. citywide. And so we've had our discussions and so I'm certainly uh, ready to support Mr. Humes. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Gonzalez. Ditto. Okay. Well, in honor of the fact that it's been three minutes since you sat down, hmm. you would like to leave in 14 minutes. Um, if there's no further discussion, I would like... Um, to move the appointment of Mr. Bobby Humes. Second. All those, any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 None opposed. And then we have no abstention. So congratulations. Thank you. Um, I also understand that you're going to be out of town. Yes. Um, so we are going to send this to the full council on July 15th, if that's all right with everybody. That's my understanding, yes. Okay. Very good. good. All right. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much. I've never seen three minutes, but I'm really proud of you. And I just want to say, just finally, um, Bobby, it's been a, my pleasure to work with you um, on our city employees retirement board on the things that you and I have discussed, just about looking down the road uh, to benefit employees with other opportunities to work. And I'm very Likewise. grateful. Likewise. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank Appreciate you so much. It. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Mosley, for coming and sitting through our first four items. <laughs> Very good. Okay, well, um, this motion passes. The committee has approved this recommendation. So our next meeting of the Finance and Neighborhoods Committee will be Wednesday, July 10th. We will take up again the sweet and beverage tax, the EDI conversations. I've already submitted uh, questions to the budget office saying let's figure out where this, what, if anything, is going to be impacted so that we can come back to the table with the full information we want. Understood. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank All you right. both for coming. Thank you. All right. The meeting's adjourned. Thank you, Lena and Allison, for being here.